Today's video is all about sex. Well, meiosis and the sexual life cycle. So almost as interesting? Stick around. Hey guys, this is Mikey from AVA Prep Academy. And in today's video, we're starting the unit five of AP Biology, which is on inheritance or heredity. And in this video, we're gonna be covering the first chapter, which is chapter 13. And this chapter gives the introduction to the ideas of genes, chromosomes, and of course, meiosis, the process through which sexually reproducing organisms can create gametes that can propagate into the next generation. And all of that hopefully should be clear by the end of this video. And before we get started, if this is your first time here, consider subscribing to our channel. We produce videos on each of the chapters of the AP Biology curriculum, in addition to Let's Solve It videos and other miscellaneous content that will hopefully help all of you guys get your fives in the May exam. And now let's get started with today's video. The first part of this video is devoted to explaining what heredity is. So what is heredity? Well, heredity is the idea that parents tend to give rise to offspring that tend to look like them. Whoa. And this is something that we've known for hundreds, if not thousands of years. After all, we've been able to domesticate organisms such as cats, dogs, rice, as well as other organisms that have been produced through a program that we call selective breeding. And our ancestors have been doing this for thousands of years. So we've known that heredity is a thing. Well, in today's age, we understand heredity a little bit better. We understand that what's actually happening between parents and offspring is that copies of genes are being passed down from the parents to the offspring in order to manifest those traits that we see in the parents in the next generation. So what are genes? Well, genes are the unit of inheritance. And what genes contain at the molecular level are sequences of DNA that, if transcribed and translated into proteins, can have an effect on how the phenotype or the expression at the physical level of that organism is going to manifest. So for example, you'll have a gene that encodes for your ABO blood type. You might also have a gene that encodes for your eye color or whether you have attached or detached earlobes and many, many, many genes that may contribute to some of the more common complex traits such as height or other expressions that are relatively complicated. What's important though is that genes are physical and that they are actual nucleotides that are placed within the DNA molecules that are all compacted into the nucleus of our cells. And every one of our cells are going to have the same DNA that allows us to express those genes at different parts of our bodies. But since this can be a little bit complicated, let's take a look at a much simpler example with an asexually reproducing bacterial species such as E. coli. Now, E. coli is a single-celled organism that is thought to asexually reproduce, meaning that it just simply clones itself. So what we learned in mitosis of chapter 12 is basically how these guys are going to reproduce and produce clone offspring. But that is not to say that there's no heredity, because as soon as binary fission or the asexual reproductive event occurs, they've effectively passed on the information that they had in their genes to the two daughter cells that they have. So how do these genes exist in a bacterial cell? Well, first, First of all, bacteria have something called a circular chromosome. And this chromosome is a long strand of DNA that starts on one end and is connected to the other side. Now for E. coli, the size of their genome is typically anywhere between five, six, or seven million base pairs with some thousands of genes that are strewn across at various locations that we call locus for singular and loci for plural. And of course the bacterial cells are gonna have genes that are gonna help them with their survival, such as the ability to produce lactase in the presence of lactose, or genes that may even help with antibiotic resistance. And these genes are going to be scattered across these chromosomes at different locations as demonstrated in this image. Now for eukaryotic organisms, the story does get a little bit more complicated. Let's take a look at some differences first. In a eukaryotic organisms like ourselves, we have not circular DNA, but linear DNA, and we have many of them. And that means for organisms like you and me, humans, we have 46 individual DNA molecules that we call 46 chromosomes that comprise our genome. But that's not quite the end of the story though, because what's actually happening with these 46 is that they actually represent 23 pairs of chromosomes, which means that we have a chromosome type chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, all the way till chromosome 23, and each of the type has a pair of chromosomes. So the first thing that we ask ourselves is why do we have pairs of chromosomes? And the answer to that is that we are sexually reproducing organisms that have a mom 
and a dad, at least biologically speaking. And that means that we get one chromosome, one from our mom, one chromosome, one from our dad, one chromosome, two from our mom, one chromosome, two from our dad, and all the way up until the 23rd chromosome, we have a pair set in our genome. So what's the consequence of this? Well, just like bacteria, we have genes that are located all along these chromosomes. But because we have two copies for each chromosome type, it also means that we have two copies of each gene. So for instance, if we're talking about the ABO blood type gene, you have the capacity to be a type AB because we receive the copy A from our mom and B from our dad or vice versa. So our phenotype or the expression of our genes really work at the level of how two copies of those genes combine and interact in the final expression. This is what we mean when we say organisms are diploid. In Greek, the word di means two. The fact that we're diploid organisms means that we have a pair of chromosomes for each of the chromosome types that we have. Sometimes we express this as 2n, and that also means that in humans, our 2n value is going to be 46. But this also produces a bit of a problem. You see, because we're not asexually reproducing organisms, I can't simply take one one of my body cells and plant it in a pot and expect another Mikey to grow, which means that we have to find a partner of the opposite sex with whom to procreate. But that means that the cell that I contribute in that reproductive event cannot be a diploid cell. Imagine for a moment that you take a diploid cell from a male and a diploid cell from a female. That would be 2N and 2N, 46 and 46. And even if you're to somehow merge those two cells together, now that resulting cell has 92 chromosomes. And and that is not how the human genome is supposed to work. So what this means, both mathematically and biologically, is that the 46 chromosomes that we have in our regular body cells must be reduced to 23 in order for us to contribute that haploid cell, that haploid or N cell to the next generation. And that process is called meiosis. You see, meiosis allows us to complete our life cycle. As this image shows, we all start off as a fertilized egg with those 46 chromosomes. And with the process of mitosis that we learned about in chapter 12, we're able to copy that zygote into the trillions of cells that make up the human body. However, as you can see, some of those cells must be reduced into the gamete cells, which are sperms or eggs in males and females respectively, in order for us to sexually reproduce successfully. And that is where we get to the second part of our video, which is the meiotic event itself. Now, in chapter 13, they don't show you any of the interface material, such as the G1 or the S phase or G2. However, you do have to consider that before meiosis begins, there is this S phase where the DNA is replicated. And that is something that you have to keep in mind. So at the beginning of meiosis, what's gonna happen for a human cell, for instance, is that each of those 46 chromosomes would have been duplicated into 92 chromosomes. And the other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the phases in meiosis are very, very similar to the phases in mitosis. And I presume that by the time you hit up chapter 13, you would already know what mitosis is all about. So I'm not gonna go into the details of those particular aspects, but I will focus on what is most important, which is the creation of genetic variation during the process of meiosis. So let's begin. Meiosis is divided into meiosis one and meiosis two. And each of the phases such as prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase are then called prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one. And of course, in meiosis two, all those phases would have the moniker two attached with them. So we'll begin with prophase one. In prophase one, a lot of the standard things happen. You have the nucleus that begins to dissolve, the spindle fibers forming, and the condensation of chromosomes that occur. And in this case, the condensation of chromosomes occur in very much the same way with sister chromatids being joined and homologous chromosomes all forming a single chromosome. However, what's really important is that the homologous chromosomes in prophase one pair up with each other. In mitosis, they didn't do that. But here, the homologous chromosomes pair up. And the reason that they do this is so that they can do a process that we call crossing over. Well, now let's take a look at this image. Here we have a pair of homologous chromosomes, one from the mom, one from the dad. And by doing this crossover, forming the chiasma, what is possible is that you have information from your mom's DNA and information from your dad's DNA that is being recombined into a unique hybrid mom slash dad DNA that we have in these middle chromatids. So as the picture suggests, 
suggest you would have a parental chromatid, you'd have two recombinant chromatids, and you'd have another parental chromatid on the other side, giving you additional genetic variability in the chromatids that you can potentially pass on to your offspring. And this happens to all of the chromosomes, with a minor exception, which is, of course, the X and the Y chromosomes. Now, another different thing happens in metaphase one of meiosis one. You see, in mitosis during metaphase, all of the chromosomes lined up in a single file line, so to say, at the metaphase plate. But here, we have homologous chromosomes that actually line up as a pair at the metaphase plate, which means that during anaphase one, we don't have the separation of sister chromatids, but rather the separation of homologous chromosomes. And what happens as a result is that during telophase, the daughter cells that actually form are not going to have identical copies of chromosomes, but have still the homologous chromosomes that have not been detached forming the daughter cells nucleus. But once we move over to meiosis two, not much really happens during prophase two. Now, once we get to metaphase two, those chromosomes will now line up in the center. And during anaphase two, they will indeed separate into those daughter chromosomes. And then once telophase occurs, you'll see that we would actually produce four haploid cells, each of which are containing one set of the entire chromosomal package. And not only that, each of those gametes will have a unique combination of chromosomes as well as genes, which means that if any one of those were used in the reproductive event, they would be unique and individual. And that gets us to the last point, which is why meiosis does what it does. And it has all to do with genetic variation. Genetic variation is the name of the game when it comes to sexual reproduction. It seems that sexual reproduction actually evolved in order to create as much genetic variability in the offspring as possible. Now, the reason for this is very simple. Environments are constantly changing. And as organisms get bigger, the environment that they interface with becomes bigger and more stochastic. And what you really wanna do in these environments Environments is to vary your offspring to the greatest degree. And what that does is that it allows your offspring to potentially survive the uncertainties of the future environment. And what that means is that none of the siblings will be genetic clones of each other unless they're identical twins. And going back to meiosis, let's talk about how genetic variation can be created. Now, firstly, we have crossing over. Crossing over, as you may recall, mixes the copies of genes that you got from your mom and your dad. By creating combinations of your parental chromosomes, you're able to truly create a unique chromosome that you pass on to your offspring. Next is how the chromosomes align during metaphase. In an earlier picture, I showed you that during metaphase one, these chromosomes pair up at the center of the metaphase plate. However, the way that they pair up, as in whether you have the paternal chromosomes lining the top, maternal chromosomes lining the bottom, or whether you have pop, mom, mom, pop, pop, mom, or any of those combinations, well, those are all random, which means that by the end of that anaphase, you'll start meiosis two with a relatively unique combination that happens every time that meiosis occurs. And lastly, once you produce your gametes, whether it be sperm or the eggs, which of those gametes will be involved in conception is also going to be relatively random. As in, we don't know which of the eggs are being released during the particular ovulation period that the egg becomes fertilized. And of course, from the thousands and thousands of sperm cells that are swimming toward that egg, well, only one is going to fertilize that egg and that's gonna be a relatively random process. And all of those three factors will contribute to creating an individual that is truly genetically unique and that is who you are. So guys, that's a brief overview of chapter 13. As we move on to chapters 14 and 15, we'll be linking a lot of ideas back to the things that we've been discussing today. And a lot of what I discussed, especially with meiosis, is relatively difficult to do by just talking to you guys on the camera. So at some point, I will create a different video that goes into the importance of things like the independent assortment of chromosomes on a tablet format so you guys can follow along. And I hope this video was helpful for you today. If so, consider subscribing to our channel if you haven't done already. Click the like button to let us know what kind of content that you guys enjoy and we'll bring you more in the next video. This has been Mikey, have a great day.